Well, good morning, everyone. It's an absolute joy to see you. Um, we're so thrilled to be here with you and to welcome you to the annual Emily Dickinson Poetry Walk. This tradition has been ongoing for 37 years. It was initiated by a group of Amherst-based Dickinson enthusiasts and was adopted by the Emily Dickinson Museum. And today it continues to draw new and returning devotees each year. We're so thrilled that you're here with us. I am Brooke Steinhauser. I'm the program director at the Emily Dickinson Museum. And I will be hosting this event with my colleagues, Elizabeth Bradley, our education programs manager, and Emma Ryan, our 2021 David T. Porter intern. Emma and Elizabeth, would you like to say hello? Hello, everyone. So glad to be here. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited for this. So today we commemorate the 135th anniversary of Dickinson's death. This year's poetry walk is held virtually. And while the museum is, is closed for the pandemic and for an exciting restoration project that will return the homestead interiors to their 19th century appearance. A big silver lining of this virtual platform is that we are welcoming participants from around the world today. And we are also delighted to co-present this program with Mass Poetry as part of their 2021 Massachusetts Poetry Festival going on right now with over 60 events and over 100 speakers this weekend. For more information or to register for our other for other festival events, you can visit festival.masspoetry.org. And we will put that link in the chat, as well as the social media handles for our friends at Mass Poetry. So if you're joining us from the festival, thanks so much for being with us today. During the next hour, we will virtually visit six locations significant to the life of, the, of Emily Dickinson. At each stop, you'll enjoy readings of Dickinson poems by volunteers, as well as 10 contemporary poets who will each read original work coupled with a Dickinson poem. Full poem text will appear on the screen. Please note that we have uh, cited Dickinson poems using the annotation FR, which indicates the poem as numbered by editor Ralph Franklin. You may also notice that closed captioning is available during this program. If you prefer not to see those subtitles, you can turn them off on the bottom of your screen. If you, if you go to that setting, the, close, the live transcript setting, you can turn off the subtitles there. In keeping with the global nature of this virtual event, our theme for this year's walk is travel. We at the museum have certainly missed welcoming travelers to the homestead and the evergreens, and we are looking forward to doing so again next spring when we'll be able to share newly restored spaces with you. At the end of our program today, we will hear from museum director, Jane Wald, a bit more about this ongoing project. Would you like to say hello, Jane? Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm excited to tell you a little bit later uh, some details of our restoration. And meanwhile, let's let's walk together. Thanks, Jane. And thanks to all of you, all of our virtual visitors. We so appreciate that you have joined us from around the world. Travel may not be the first word associated with Dickinson, but as you will see, she too maintained connections near and far. And today we will see how her striking verse was a vehicle for her exploration of new shores and new ideas. So without further ado, let's begin our walk at the homestead built in 1813 by Dickinson's paternal grandfather. It's a stately brick home on Main Street in Amherst, where Dickinson's life journey began in 1830 and ended on this day in 1886. Today, we at the museum are always delighted to receive mail, whether physical letters, postcards, or emails from visitors, friends, and Dickinson fans from around the world. In Dickinson's time, countless missives were sent to and delivered from the homestead on Amherst Main Street. Those sent from Emily might be accompanied by pressed flowers, baked goods, or if the recipient was lucky, a poem. Near the end of her life, she wrote, a letter is a joy of earth. It is denied the gods. Dickinson corresponded with friends near and far, faithfully writing her Amherst neighbors, the Sweesters, as well as her literary preceptor, Thomas Wentworth Higginson in Newport, and girlhood friend and successful author, Helen Hunt Jackson in Colorado. Over 1,000 existing Dickinson letters to over 100 correspondents have been published, but scholars believe her to have written closer to 10,000 in her lifetime. Many of her poems were sent with letters, but even those that weren't sent with poems possess a 
epistolary qualities having been composed on envelopes or ephemera. As you can imagine, we've seen many memes during the pandemic urging people to take a Dickinsonian approach by seeking creativity at home. But one of the best lessons we can take from Dickinson is to reach out and stay connected. Here are poems on letters and on writing in the homestead read by Becky and Brenna and contemporary poets, Hannah Baker Saltmarsh and Laurie Desrogier. The way I read a letter's this, tis first I lock the door and push it with my fingers. Next for transport it be sure. And then I go the furthest off to counteract a knock. Then draw my little letter forth and slowly pick the lock. Then glancing narrow at the wall and narrow at the floor for firm conviction of a mouse not exercised before. Peruse how infinite I am to no one that you know and sigh for lack of heaven, but not the heaven God bestow. All the letters I can write are not as fair as this. Syllables of velvet, sentences of plush, depths of ruby undrained, hid lip for thee. Play it were a hummingbird and just sit me. Writing in Emily Dickinson's bedroom. They give me a pencil so as not to stain her white lace room with ink. How does the presence of hundreds of visitors disturb her cherished privacy? Does she sigh at each clack of footsteps on the stairs? Her washing bowl, blue and white, porcelain for ablutions, where she washed off soot from the stove or ink from her fingers. Quill on her writing table, an ink well empty, no ink allowed, even for a ghost. If it had no pencil, would it try mine? Worn now and dull, sweet, writing much to thee. If it had no word, would it make the daisy most as big as I was when it plucked me? Emily Dickinson, Keeping House, 280 Main Street. Dickinson, is that you? Brass knuckling the dough? You, behind the mask of a half-open cabinet door, white apron stuffed with scraps, envelopes, and bleeding pen. Licking the tips of the scarlet thread for your stack, which would be flung open after your funeral in the library. So safe in their alabaster chambers, your soul Dreaming, folded up in drawers and chests your brother's lovers fight over. And there is always your sister L looking. Did you really report to the IRS your occupation is keeping house? Skimming milk, massaging bouncy flour into flickering yeast, you fall into the handwritten of the soul overhearing itself. Domestic poems on wrappers, scraps, gorgeous nothings, envelopes out of slivers of light between chores, the heat of it all while the bread rises the second time longer. Sometimes writing not by window, but misty pillow, not that you are ever alone. You have your poems, letters, all the no ones, the hills, the sundown, a dog large as yourself, the noise in the pool, excelling your piano, brother, sister, a mother who doesn't care for thought, a father too busy with his briefs to notice. The you I know is by schoolgirl heart. Tell me, not now, but not never, what rose in you like beads of yeast. My daughter knows it's a new day, though her hands look the same. Whenever, in your poems, shatter me with dawn. A little bread, a crust, a crumb, a little trust, a demijohn can keep the soul alive. Not portly mind, but breathing, warm, conscious as old Napoleon the night before the crown. A modest lot, a fame petite, a brief campaign of sting and sweet is plenty, is enough. A sailor's business is the shore, a soldier's balls. Who asketh more must seek the neighboring life. 
from the homestead, we have taken the path just wide enough for two who love, due west about 200 yards to the Evergreens. The Evergreens, built in 1856 for the poet's brother Austin and sister-in-law Susan, was renowned for its hospitality and sparkling conversation. Over the years, Susan Dickinson welcomed many prominent guests, including Ralph Waldo Emerson, Harriet Beecher Stowe, and Wendell Phillips. Some guests enjoyed their visits so much that they forgot their prior commitments, a testament to Sue's skill as a hostess. In 1857, after giving a literary address at Amherst College, Wendell Phillips agreed to dine at the Evergreens. It completely slipped his mind that he had also agreed to dine with his sister until a courier arrived for him during dessert. Susan later remembered, after a great laugh all around the table, at the situation, he excused himself with evident reluctance. Emily Dickinson was a frequent visitor in the Evergreens' early years. Friend Kate Scott Anton remembered celestial evenings in the library, the blazing wood fire, Emily, Austin, the music, the rampant fun. While the poet increasingly excused herself from parties next door, there's no doubt that the intellectual atmosphere and the books and ideas she continued to share with Susan were rich influences on her poetry. We look forward to the time we can welcome you back as guests to this grand house. For now, please enjoy these Dickinson poems read by David and Patrick and contemporary poems by Abigail Price and Kate Godin in celebration of Susan Dickinson and Celestial Evenings in the Library. The luxury to apprehend the luxury would be to look at the a single time an epicure of me in whatsoever presence makes till for a further food I scarcely recollect to starve so first I am supplied. The luxury to meditate, the luxury it was to banquet on thy countenance a sumptuousness supplies to plainer days whose table far I certainly can see, is laden with a single crumb, the consciousness of thee. When I met Emily Dickinson for the first time in a strange library in England. The vision of you in Amherst, I could envision you in the divine, looking into evergreens, Sue, always on your mind. My gosh, when you kissed her, I Miss Dickinson, I saw it. The volcanoes you talked about when you looked into her iris. I felt the war of, of being a woman and being a human in hand. You were ahead of your time, fighting for the home, the earth, the people and the land. And Henry, I also cried for him and for you. But most of all, dear Emily, I cried for you and Sue. I saw your words as a cradle with no physical form. You had no possession, no obligation, no children to be born. A label of all things is the most over assumed title. Alongside Becca, the theory, why can't a woman be anything but spiteful? A pure woman on the other hand, joined a thunderstorm alone. We write, we speak out and evidently we end up alone. He was my host, he was my guest. I never to this day, if I invited him could talk or he invited me. So infinite our intercourse, so intimate indeed, analysis as capsule seemed to keeper of the seed. The soul that soul. hath a guest doth seldom go abroad, diviner crowd at home, obliterate the need and courtesy forbids the host's departure when upon himself be visiting the emperor of men. Wild Emily, you kneel in the kitchen garden, white dress, blue shawl, bare feet on a Sunday free of services, save for warm gingerbread and the prayer of bees. For you know, and I know, 
both a solitude of sea and the power of Vesuvius are more easily found at home. Well, the keepers of your story denied your earthy defiance and erased your love for Sue. They had their agendas and I have mine, but it's simple, connect. So I drive to Amherst early under silhouette portraits smudged by the thumb of God against a brightening sky, that shade of blue whose fingers undo buttons and laces. This sky was made for lovers, for tumbled hair and tousled breath. I will sit in your parlor with your words in my mouth, sweet entanglement of thought and feeling. There are no recluse spinsters here. I am alive, I guess. The branches on my hand are full of morning glory. And at my finger's end, the carmine tingles warm. And if I hold the glass across my mouth, it blurs it, physician's proof of breath. I am alive because I am not in a room, the parlor commonly it is, so visitors may come and lean and view it sidewise and add, how cold it grew, and was it conscious when it stepped in immortality? I am alive because I do not own a house, entitled to myself, precise, and fitting no one else, and marked my girlhood's name so visitors may know which door is mine, and not mistake and try another key. How good to be alive, how infinite to be alive twofold, the birth I had and this besides in thee. Our next stop is the Brick Station House for the Amherst and Belchertown Railroad, situated less than a quarter mile to the east of the Dickinson's property. After hearing about a new railroad line stretching from New London, Connecticut to Palmer, Massachusetts, the poet's father, Edward Dickinson, made it his mission to extend the line through Belchertown and Amherst. In February of 1852, after two years of fundraising, enough shares in the Amherst and Belchertown Railroad were purchased for construction to begin. Most of the town was delighted, so delighted that in a letter to Austin, Emily expressed that she wished he was there to celebrate the news. She wrote, since we have written you, the Grand Railroad decision is made, and there is great rejoicing throughout this town and the neighboring. That is Sunderland, Montague, and Belchertown. Everybody is wide awake, everything is stirring, the streets are full of people talking cheeringly, and you really should be here to partake of the Jubilee. With the tracks and station house so close to the homestead, the railroad was often mentioned in Emily's correspondences. She mentions hiding in the woods to watch the, tr the train go by and commented when the trains began to travel through Amherst twice a day instead of once. She wrote to Austin, it sounds so pleasantly to hear them come in twice. I hope there will be a bell soon. Even today, you can still hear the train rumble through Amherst and sound its horn. Dickinson herself seldom traveled, but she did venture to Philadelphia, Washington, DC, and a few times to Boston. However, her poems are sprinkled with references to transit and transport, both actual and metaphorical. In our next readings by Greg and Allen, and including poems by Bonnie Larson Steiger and Peter Schmidt, will encounter trains, boats, balloons, and finally, baseballs, which might entice Dickinson back to Boston. We send the wave to find the wave, an errand so divine, the messenger enamored too, forgetting to return. We make the sage decision still, so ever made in vain. The only time to damn the sea is when the sea is gone. She sent the wave. Into the tidal pool of her poems I wade, the tranquil, seductive, landlocked undercurrent tugs at my ankles. Water royals, words blow, now lapping at my nose. She barely lets me breathe. Her room, a boat, poised her precious cargo across the yard, a frigate to the ocean. Enveloped in sage waves, 
I surrender sinews and sinew and do not dam the sea. You've seen balloons set, haven't you? So stately they ascend. It is as swans discarded you for duty's diamond. Their liquid feet go softly out upon a sea of blonde. They spurn the air as twere too mean for creatures so renowned. Their ribbons just beyond the eye, they struggle some for breath. And yet the crowd applaud below, <clears throat> they would not encore death. The gilded creature strains and spins, trips frantic in a tree, tears open her imperial veins and tumbles in the sea. The crowd retire with an oath, the dust in streets go down and clerks in counting rooms observe, "'Twas only a balloon." I like to see it lap the miles and lick the valleys up and stop to feed itself at tanks and then prodigious step around a pile of mountains and supercilious peer in shanties by the sides of roads and then a quarry pair to fit its sides and crawl between complaining all the while in horrid hooting stanza, then chase itself downhill and neigh like Bonerges, then prompter than a star, stop, docile and omnipotent at its own stable door. There is no frigate like a book to take us lands away, nor any coursers like a page of prancing poetry. This traverse may the poorest take without a press of toil. How frugal is the chariot that bears the human soul. Emily Dickinson and the Boston Red Sox with an epigraph of October 27, 2004. In her white cap with the scarlet bee, she watches the small color TV no flat screen plasma or LCD for her, she would have you know. And she much admires the home team's jerseys and jackets, thinking what a lovely bird, the Cardinal, at her feeder, that blur of passion, and how lucky in a way, a strange way, they will be now, those fans west of here, the trophy so close, Unlike all those poor Yankee stalwarts, year after year, their routine champagne and ticker tape, how truly deprived, not knowing what desire means. In fact, she's traveled to the city only once, when she had that pesky eye malady and went in to see specialists at the infirmary. But first came the cab ride, her kindly driver, straight to Fenway and the Green Monster, a name she wishes keenly she'd coined herself for spring with the trees out beyond the fences suddenly looming. And it is only envy that she feels now, eyeing the melee on the mound, the grass thinning this deep in fall, for all the dumbstruck seated there, mute, staring at the other team, her team, leaping deliriously with their improbable victory and all of that sweet joy already slipping away so naturally. Just south of the Dickinson family houses, within easy walking distance, lies the verdant campus of Amherst College. The Dickinson family was intimately associated with the college for the first 75 years of its existence. Emily's grandfather, Samuel, was a founder, and her father, Edward, and brother, Austin, were its treasurers for a combined 60 years. The family's close connection to the college expanded the poet's intellectual horizons. Emily was apprised of the latest research and received news of Amherst community members and friends abroad in Europe, Syria, India, and other locales. Her poetic references circumnavigated the globe 
with sojourns to all seven continents. But perhaps her most distant travels came in the form of reveries on the past. As a student at sister school Amherst Academy, just up the street from the college, she learned to read Latin and studied the classics. As an adult visiting Amherst, Dickinson would have been able to see Edward Hitchcock's fossil bird tracks and plaster casts of Egyptian, Greek, Roman, and Mycenaean sculpture collected by Richard Henry Mather. Our next readings by Colin and Brenna reflect on how and whether literature can bridge past and present. The past in Dickinson's poems is paradoxical, near enough for her to recognize kinsmen in the shelves, and so unfathomably far as to remain always a curious creature. Contemporary poets Elizabeth Bolton and Donald Skoog share their own encounters of Dickinson as a kinsman of their shelves. Strong drafts of their refreshing minds to drink enables mine through desert or the wilderness as bore it sealed wine to go elastic or as one the camel's trait attained, how powerful the stimulus of an hermetic mind. Where we worshiped. Did anyone else in my sixth grade classroom upon learning of the Greek gods immediately go home to a closet to worship them? Did anyone else find in Emily Dickinson a sort of daughterless Demeter who made it okay to be dead half the time? Did anyone else find in the Anglican way a lack of poetry, but for the sad spooky richness of Yule? Who among us worshiped over our afternoon snacks, vowed to believe only in a God who would play with us at recess? Yesterday is history, tis so far away. Yesterday is poetry, tis philosophy. Yesterday is mystery, where it is today, while we shrewdly speculate, flutter both away. The past is such a curious creature. To look at her, to look her in the face, a transport may recede us or a disgrace. Unarmed, if any meet her, I charge him fly, her faded ammunition might yet reply. Amherst. Books should be eaten, scribbled on, used to mark your way through loping trails with letters like breadcrumbs dropped as clues. Use pen and pencil, dog ear each page, scrawl yourself forward on toward the mage and take the bait that lures you to the poet's trap, her gift for you. When words become birds flying up in a flock, circling round and around in your head, every idea is both truth and lie. Each word as it's written is meant to fly, yet all are doomed and all misled because there is no way to choose one path among the many wooed. The hand that fed the flock lies cold, a century and more at rest, her voice now quiet, her tune now old, yet her birds still fly inside my ear, begging me at least to listen, hear, fluttering, twittering, they sing her song, her silent pen's reach is still so long. To where do worded breadcrumbs lead? How ends the journey you take alone? How to still the inner need to quell the ache and hunger feed? O poetess, spirit, hear my cry. Rise from the grave within which you lie and sing me words benevolent seer that call my longing soul from here. Unto my books so good to turn, far ends of tired days, it half endears the abstinence and pain is missed in praise. As flowers cheer retarded guests with banquetings to be, so spices stimulate the time till my small library. It may be wilderness without far feet of failing men. A holiday excludes the night 
and it is bells within. I thank these kinsmen of the shelf, their countenances kid, enamor in perspective, and satisfy, obtain. While Emily lived most of her life at the homestead, she had another childhood home. Due to financial difficulties, the Dickinson family moved in 1840 to a house around the corner from the homestead on North Pleasant Street, near the town center and adjacent to the cemetery where we will end our program this afternoon. It was a grand old house with a garden, orchard, grapevines, and a small grove of pine trees planted by her brother Austin. In the 15 years the poet lived there, she completed her education, began composing letters and poems, and cemented early friendships. The family's move back to the nearby homestead was momentous for her father, Edward, but bittersweet for Emily, who had to bid farewell to childhood memories. Reflecting on a move her heart was not in, she wrote, I think home is where the house is and the adjacent buildings. The North Pleasant Street house is no longer standing. Perhaps befitting our theme of travel, it is currently the site of a mobile gas station. The geography of Emily Dickinson's life is circuitous, running from the homestead to Pleasant Street to the homestead, then back to her final resting place in the West Cemetery. At this stop, which includes readings by Maddie and Greg and poets Rebecca Starks and Siri Palretti, will reflect on Emily's childhood, on moving house, on things left behind, and on returning. Eden is that old fashioned house we dwell in every day without suspecting our abode until we drive away. How fair on looking back the day we sauntered from the door, unconscious far returning, but discover it no more. The props assist the house until the house is built and then the props withdraw and adequate, erect, the house support itself and cease to recollect the auger and the carpenter. Just such a retrospect hath the perfected life, a past of plank and nail and slowness, then the scaffold drop, affirming it a soul. The things that never can come back are several, childhood, some forms of hope, the dead, though joys like men may sometimes make a journey and still abide. We do not mourn for traveler or sailor, their roots are fair, but think enlarged of all that they will tell us, returning here. Here, there are typic here's foretold locations. The spirit does not stand himself at whatsoever fathom his native land. It happened twice. June 16, 1874, death of Emily's father, December 9, 1874, transit of Venus, November 14, 1882, death of Emily's mother, December 6, 1882, transit of Venus. It happened twice, the sun it dimmed infinitesimally, like some new ribboned holiday for coronal, a wreath. Just as I brushed off snow where it obscured my name, I felt her shadow pass and froze. She must have felt the sum of that great distance none can reach, the instant few measure, the transit of the morning star, orbit inferior, its teardrop first a blur across the darkened limb, and then its path irresolute, and then a near eclipse. Amherst Violet. An Amherst girl, witty and bright, I knew her once, before. Auburn eyes and ringlets of hair with admirers calling at her door. When she came upon a looking glass, it delighted in what it saw. Cheeks flushed, apple tones, a daffodil crown bound in her locks. Happiest in the soil of her plants, intimate with nature's offerings, her herbarium in her hands, each meadow blossom bent towards her glad to be in the care of her hands. The clouds sprinkled their droplets to wet their loyal friend as the bees buzzed in chorus, welcoming their queen's ascent to them. I walked through my garden, joyous, 
grass blades tickling my ankles, sunshine caressing my hair on this bright morning. Yet night blanketed its body upon me, suffocating my sight while I morphed into a mole black as velvet death. Burrowing into the dirt alone, exiled to solitude and blind. And I've never felt so cold during these eight months in Siberia. Subterranean isolation, I scurry to what I hope is the light to my dilemma. But I forget that my garden is my prison. My iris once encompassed the sphere, earth in which we dwell, each hue and shadow dropping into two endless wells. Sunbeams sifting in through slivers in the barn door to illuminate two hen eggs, wheat shaded, hiding in the hay. A vision so keen that no object in existence this poet's eye could not unveil. An artist who knew what lay beneath the canvas sheet. Sight is valued most by us, the blind, searching for the panacea on a trail traveled by few until fog sets in, blocking my path to imagination. I haven't told my garden yet, lest that should conquer me. I haven't quite the strength now to break it to the bee. I will not name it in the street, for shops would stare at me that one so shy, so ignorant, should have the face to die. The hillsides must not know it, where I have rambled so, nor tell the loving forest the day that I shall go, nor lisp it at the table, nor heedless by the way, hint that within the riddle, one will walk today. Just northwest of the homestead, is West Cemetery, the oldest burying ground associated with the European settled town of Amherst in the 18th century. It's here that the poet was laid to rest after her death on May 15, 1886. The cause of death entered on her death certificate was Bright's disease, a kidney malady generally diagnosed in Dickinson's time. But today, researchers identify her end-of-life symptoms as more consistent with high blood pressure leading to heart failure. The family plot at the cemetery is demarcated by a wrought iron fence, and Emily was interred there next to her parents and followed some years later by her sister Lavinia. Today, visitors from around the world pay their respects here leaving behind pebbles, poems, flowers, pencils, and other trinkets. At this, our final stop, we'll begin with a tribute poem from poet Robin Long. My dead therapist, she breathes and speaks sweeter than the living, transcends centuries through ink-stained pages a soul encapsulated, immortality granted in parchment. She shakes shoulders, steals into mind, and so the question presses, what defines a life? The power to move, to influence, like she bends, mends my thoughts and my perceptions. The power to awaken, like her fingertip tapping at the center of my brow, rousing me from ignorance. The power to refine, to reframe consciousness, that soul's last mystery of existence and keep it alive. If so, can she defy a life? Set the standard spinning, snatch death from its marble plated mantle and label it Transition instead. Distill the essence of earths of separation into sheer curtains hung in folds from afternoon windows. A simple haze over a savior whose life pours out in lines like the light stretched soft on the leaves of my book.
After her death, Dickinson took one final journey. In accordance to her own instructions, her white casket was carried on a bier through the back door of the homestead, around the garden, through the barn, and through her neighbor's lots to the village burial ground. We wonder if this journey was how she imagined it in life, in this now famous poem read by museum director Jane Wald. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but just ourselves and immortality. We slowly drove, he knew no haste, and I had put away my labor and my leisure too for his civility. We passed the school where children strove at recess in the ring. We passed the fields of gazing grain. We passed the setting sun or rather he passed us. The dews drew quivering and chill for only gossamer, my gown, my tippet, only tool. We paused before a house that seemed a swelling of the ground. The roof was scarcely visible, a cornice in the ground. Since then, two centuries, and yet feel shorter than the day I first surmised the horses' heads or toward eternity. Traditionally, attendees of our annual poetry walk are given a white daisy to leave beside the grave as we raise a lighthearted lemonade toast to the poet. This year, many of you made a gift to the museum in Dickinson's memory or in memory of a loved one. And for each of those, a daisy was placed just this morning by our dedicated staff at the grave while poems were read. So I'd like to welcome museum director Jane Wall back again with some words of appreciation for helping us to keep this tradition alive. Thank you, Brooke. This it is indeed a wonderful tradition, and it's a privilege for us to be able to join you in remembering those you've loved across the year and all the years by laying daisies in their honor. It's good to remember, as Emily told us, uh, unable are the love to die, for love is immortality. So we thank you for your virtual presence here today and for your memorial donations, um, such thoughtful donations. Uh, which enable us to bring remote experiences like this one to you. This year, you've sustained our hopes and our purpose with your support, and we are just infinitely grateful. Perching in the world's soul is the hope that we're emerging from the pandemic that's affected our lives in so many ways for more than a year. And even as the world opens up, the Emily Dickinson Museum will still be in a bit of a hiatus for the rest of this year, so we can take on the largest and most meaningful restoration we've ever done at the homestead. Uh, so I'd just like to share a few, uh, a few thoughts about that with you and um, make sure that you know that we'll be keep staying in touch with you uh, to bring you uh, uh, news about the progress of this project as it unfolds. So just a quick kind of description. We'll completely restore the interior spaces in the main block of the house, the, the part of the house built in 1813 by Emily's grandfather. So this includes the main parlors, the main stair hall, the bed chamber on the second floor uh, behind Emily's own room and the broad second floor hall. And as we've done uh, with other restorations, we've rescued uh, scraps and fragments of original wallpaper that you know have been hidden behind ceilings and uh, baseboards for more than a hundred years um, to reproduce those and reintroduce those into, uh, into all these spaces. We found um, scraps of vibrant, colorful floor cloths at the evergreens that will be reproduced for the homestead main hall also. And we've located a mill, a textile mill in England that will weave a 19th century pattern matching the description of the carpet in the parlors uh, that was described as a fine Brussels with great baskets of flowers uh, spilling across the floor. These uh, and so many other features will wholly alter the sense of the house from a, from a, a kind of a neutral canvas to, to a vital active dwelling more that would be more familiar to Emily Dickinson herself. 
So we look forward to this work, uh, to sharing prog progress on it with you in the, in the uh, months ahead, and to welcoming you back to Emily Dickinson's home beginning in spring 2022. Thank you, Jane. Yes, we are all so excited for this work and, and so excited to see you back at the museum soon. So now we come to the end of our program and it's time to offer our toast. I'm going to invite um, all of you to join in with us. I'm pasting a poem into the chat for all of us. And I'm gonna invite Patrick to stop screen share so that we can all of our wonderful readers today unmute ourselves and we're going to raise our glasses together and we will say go, go like a great, great way. way the, the stars, stars are are even as they for what are our stars but asterisks to point to a, a human, human life. life. Cheers, Cheers, everybody, to Emily Dickinson. <laughs> uh, that one was in at the end. Anyway. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much, everybody. What a delightful morning to spend with you or afternoon or evening, wherever you're tuning in from. We want to thank you once again for your participation today and a special thank you to all of these wonderful poetry readers and poets who shared their work and shared Emily Dickinson's work today. We hope that you will go visit our webpage, the museum's webpage on this program to learn more about these contemporary poets that you heard from today. They have websites, they have books you might like to buy and they are very worth finding out more about. So definitely, check out our webpage for this program. And speaking of the event page, that is where you will also find our virtual guest book for today's program. And this has been a tradition for our live program back when, you, when we held it at the museum that we would have a guest book every year. So we are carrying that tradition on uh, virtually. We hope you will take a moment to fill out an entry. Tell us where you're tuning in from, leave a celebratory message or a tribute to Dickinson on this special day. You will be directed to that page when we close the Zoom program. And I'm also going to put the link in the chat right now for everyone. There we go. So to share your experience of the Poetry Walk, you can tag us at Emily Dickinson Museum on Instagram or on Facebook. We do hope that you will keep in touch with us at the museum and join us again soon for more virtual programs. Later this month, our Phosphorescence Poetry Series continues with poets Melissa Range and Erica Cheris Malling, who will share their poems and reflect on the Dickinsonian influences in their work. For more information on this or other programs, go to emilydickinsonmuseum.org. Thank you again so much, everyone, for being with us today. We at the museum sincerely wish you well, and we hope that you're taking good care of yourself and of each other. Thank you very much. Thank you, readers. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you soon. And Elizabeth, I'll ask you to end the program. <laughs>